Hello listeners and welcome to the Montel Weekly Podcast, bringing you energy matters in an informal setting. In today's pod, we return to the topic of market design, and in particular, the ways in which to optimise cross-border trading and hedging. What are virtual energy hubs? Are they needed? And how could they help liquidity in forward electricity markets? What other proposals are on the table? And what is the role of TSOs? I'm Richard Sverson, and joining me today is Leon Hurt, um, Professor of Energy Policy at the Hertie School in Berlin and, and Director of Neon Energy. A, a warm welcome to you, Leon. Hello, I'm glad to be here. Before we delve into the sort of nitty gritty and the more technical areas of wholesale market reform or proposals, how would you evaluate the current state of play in, in Europe's wholesale energy markets? I think by and large, um, we are out of the crisis for a year now. I, 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 would, I would date the, the end of the crisis actually to kind of new years of last year. So I think it's now 14 months that we are out of the crisis. And it's surprisingly calm, right? I mean, the, the, the pri- prices for both gas and, and electricity and more lately carbon also have fallen back very much from the, from the peak levels in mid-2022 and are quite moderate and things are almost boring, I, I would say. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, in some countries like Spain, they're falling to 10-year lows wholesale uh, uh, electricity prices. So do you think then, um, you know, markets came out of this sort of very robust, they showed themselves to be stable and to deal with these kind of price shocks? So post, I was thinking post-COVID, but also post-energy crisis. I think yes and no. I think markets have worked pretty fine throughout the crisis uh, and pretty much saved us in, in many ways. I think what didn't work so fine was society and policy responding to that. I think what's pretty, pretty clear now that the appetite for interventions into markets is high, larger than I expected, and the willingness to to see prices and accept prices that might be beyond the ordinary uh, is very limited. And I don't blame policymakers so much because they they very much felt the pressure by their citizens and voters and and, and the public. Um, But um, I I think the idea of having regulators and policymakers, for example, accepting scarcity prices seems to be a bit wilder than it used to be uh, in my eyes. And do you think there are justified calls to change some of the market, some of the market design in particular? I think market design is an ongoing project, right? We've been working on this Mm. for 20 years now. I mean, I I wasn't there 20 years ago, but I I joined on the way and and people have thought about this for 40 or 50 years since the 1980s and, and have started implementing this across Europe in the 1990s and 2000s. And it's never a standstill, right? We've, We've changed and improved and and amended many things on the way. I mean, if you think about how balancing markets on the very short term work today with Picasso and Mali and European harmonization, as opposed to just 10 years ago, when everything was very much national. And in fact, Germany was split into four pretty much separate balancing areas. So things things have changed and things should change. And there's a lot more things to improve on the margin. I think was what was a bit of a unnecessary detour was that discussion about a radical change of kind of implementing a different way of pricing rules and kicking, essentially throwing marginal pricing out of the window and inventing something completely new that of course no one did invent, right? That was mm. just a very strange discussion uh, uh, and, and and sort of random fantasies. Uh, and in, the, in that sense, there is no need to change markets, but there is mm. a lot of work that is ongoing and that should be ongoing on improving market design on the margin. Absolutely. So we had a, we've had a few diversions, but we're back on track then, you'd say, Leon. Um, I mean, in particular, I think we want to focus more on, on, on cross-border trading uh, in forwards and futures market. But, but before we get onto that topic, do you, do you find that the forward markets in electricity and gas are, are liquid enough at the moment? Is there enough liquidity in, in, those, in those markets? I think from a, from a company that would like to hedge from a generator perspective or a load serving entity perspective, I think there can never be enough liquidity, right? The more is always the better here. You want to you wanna buy and sell. You want to have deep markets. You want to buy and sell whatever volumes you, you, you want at any point in time. Um, and of course, we have the issue that many European forward markets are relatively short, have short horizons, right? I mean, we're talking about liquid markets, one, two, three years into the future. And this is, of course, falling short dramatically the investment horizon of of any asset, right? Even batteries you can't hedge, uh, but certainly not generation assets. 
Um, and that would be, of course, something that we ultimately would like, right? Ideally, you would hedge your investment um, at the point of FID on, on liquid forward markets, but that's very, very far from where we are. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think we do have a, a forward markets that are much more liquid than in many other places of the world. We have a we have a de facto German physical hub that serves for hedging purposes for most European uh, companies across the continent that has a churn rate of, of maybe eight or so. And that's mm. pretty nice for the for the frontier. No, absolutely. But we're seeing with the, the hedging strategy of some big utilities is changing. Some are pulling back from 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 um, from selling three years in advance as they may have used to due to, you know, uh, the volatility of prices, the volatility of, or the intermittency issues with renewable generation. Do you, how how do you see that? I'm not so sure if the intermittency issue is is a main thing here, right? So I I'm trying to tell people that if you want to hedge, this is a price insurance decision, right? You want to insure yourself against price risk, and that's that's very different from selling the output that you're physically going to produce, and that's very much deep in the in the mind of both producers, generators, and um, and consumers as well as policymakers and regulators. So, so people tend to tell me we can't use baseload futures to hedge our wind park because we're not producing baseload. And, and mm -hmm. I, my response would be, yes, you're not producing baseload, but that still means a baseload future is a very reasonable hedge, certainly much, much better than no hedge at all, right? Because mm -hmm. the wind output, the capture price that you're going to earn is highly correlated uh, with the base price uh, on, on timescales of a year or two. Um, so I think that's not the main driver here. I think the main driver for changes in hedging strategy has been um, certainly some of the policy interventions, but maybe more profoundly the margining re requirements during the crisis where it was just the amount of mm. cash that some, <laughs> though I pretty much every firm had to deposit was just, mm. had reached numbers that, that were too high even for the deepest pockets. And it's very sensible for firms to respond by this by adjusting their their risk position and and reducing exposure to margin calls and mm -hmm. and maybe uh, move move more to to forwards that are non cleared and and hopefully go back to cleared futures um, uh, over time. Yeah, no, I mean it's very interesting and it'd be interesting to see you know in in company results and and what happens over the coming months um, as we as you say as we've moved out of the energy crisis and return to some some level of normality again in terms of um, energy prices. And EU energy regulatory body ASA has called for regional virtual hubs to improve forward uh, power liquidity. Can you explain what a virtual hub is and how it would work? Maybe let, let's start with a, a bit of the context before we dive sure. into this. I know virtual hubs are on everyone's mind and was 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 a prominent part of the market reform discussion in Brussels over the last couple of months. But mm. the proposal that ASA has made is actually much more much broader, much more far-reaching, and also older um, than the discussion. So Acer, I think it was in June 2022, has published a, a policy paper that I think my reading is that it kind of preparing the ground for reform of the um, uh, um, uh, of the guideline that's regulating these long-term cross-border uh, uh, contracts. Um, and they've um, suggested to do all kind of reforms. For example, um, having these um, transmission rights, these long-term transmission rights being auctioned off more frequently and at longer maturities and changing their derivative types so instead of options having spread futures and installing a virtual hub. That's, so that's just it's like, like mm. I think we should think of this as one of the pieces of the reform agenda that ASA has, has pushed forward. Mm. So what is a virtual hub? A virtual hub is a different price index that serves as the underlying asset of forward prices. Mm. So today across the continent, if you sign a forward contract, a financial future or forward in, denominated in Germany or France, it's the German spot price or the French spot price respectively that is used to settle the contract. Mm. That's different in the Nordic region, right? If you buy a future on the system price, it's the system price that serves as the underlying. So that's the underlying asset that's that's used to settle the future. And the system price is a virtual hub. So a virtual mm. hub is a new definition of an underlying that is serving um, to settle forwards and future contracts. Mm. Um and why introduce that in the continent? I mean, the experience so far in the Nordic regions has suggested that it hasn't always, it's not always um, 
the, the, the most feasible solution for, for many market participants? Why then go and introduce a similar one on the continent where, where the markets seem to function quite, quite well? That, that's a good question. I think Acer is pointing to the Nordic region as almost as a blueprint um, in, in many ways. Um, and I understand because a lot of the decision that, that the Nordic region has taken make a lot of sense to me. So mm. theoretically, that's a very reasonable role model, but empirically, it's not <laughs> in the sense mm. that we've seen, uh, uh, of course, Nordic forward liquidity like truly collapsing over the last 10 years, right? It's, I mean, it's not, has not disappeared, but it moved from a very liquid market to something that's not very liquid anymore. So mm. empirically, it's, it's, um, it's maybe more a red flag than, than, than a clear role model. On the other hand, the idea of virtual hubs, the idea of having a somehow defined price index underlying future markets is something that's very much established and very successfully used for many, many years across the United States, right? In mm -hmm. the US where we have locational marginal pricing, um, there's very few forward markets established on locational, on nodal prices. They're almost exclusively mm -hmm. based on price averages across a broad, broader area, across multiple nodes. And that is nothing else than a virtual hub. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we've only have sort of bad examples or poor performing virtual hubs. We also have very, very well performing and, 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 and long living virtual hubs outside Europe. Mm. But do we need such hubs then in Europe? I mean, in, in the French and German markets? So we've, we've thought about this quite a bit. And to, uh, to us, it's not entirely clear. Um, I think there is a bit of a sentiment among some, maybe also some in Brussels and Ljubljana, that the, the current setup is perceived to be unfair because Germans have all this nice liquidity and the others are left in the, in the rain. Mm. And I think that perception is a misinterpretation of how markets are used because it's, of course, daily business of generation firms in Belgium and Austria and Hungary and, and France uh, and, and load-serving entities in Denmark and in Italy to use the German forward market as a hedge. Again, because hedging is not about selling or buying electricity. It's about insuring against price risk. And being insured against the German price risk is a pretty good insurance against the Hungarian or Austrian price ever because these markets are highly correlated in their, in their forward prices. So mm -hmm. proxy hedging, in a word, is very common. And it's not that only German firms use the German forward market, quite the opposite. Firms across, mm -hmm. across the continent benefit from that liquidity. So I don't see the current setup as being kind of unfair towards other bidding zones. Um, um, and, and hence, from that perspective, I don't think there's a need to act urgently. Mm. And of course, there's also a correlation here with... The, the discussion about splitting the German market zone as well, isn't there? Do you, what, do you think um, the German zone should be split? I, I think this is not just a correlation. There's there's some <laughs> causality here. Yeah, um, okay, sure. Yeah. So, so um, my own personal opinion, and I don't make many friends here in Germany with that, has has for a long time been that a split of the German bidding zone is is would be very helpful and necessary and uh, and would be very beneficial to us and our neighbors. But maybe let's not dive in, into that discussion too much. But I do mm. think the virtual hub question and the bidding zone split are linked in the following way. Mm. If the German bidding zone were to remain, let's say, for the next 10 years, if we, if, we, if we were sure the German bidding zone would stay as is for the next 10 years, my gut feeling is we don't need a virtual hub because we can continue to use the physical hub and it's very doubtful that a virtual hub would be performed better than a German market. So there's, I think, a pretty good risk that even if we introduce a virtual hub, it would stay void and, and would be little used and maybe even sort of split some liquidity and we would end up being worse off by, by having having a less liquid, like lacking a, a unique liquid big hub, physical or, or virtual. But if you believe the German bidding zone is going to be split sometime in the 2020s or so in, let's say, five or seven smaller bidding zones. If that would happen, it's much less clear that any of these bidding zones could support a big liquid physical hub because there's no kind of natural big bidding zone anymore in the middle of the continent that could kind of 
attract all that liquidity. And if we would lose that without a replacement, that would be a, an awful outcome. Then we would all be left in the rain. So in that situation, I would personally, as sort of my gut feeling tells me, we should have a virtual up, up, up and running in, 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 in sort of being prepared for that situation because then, then we need it. And that's, of course, where we enter politics, right? Then you find people who, who are arguing in favor of a virtual hub, not because they really like a virtual hub, but because they want to prepare prepare for a potential bidding zone split. And then there's mm -hmm. also others who, who argue against a virtual hub, not because they don't like it, but just they want to pretend uh, or they want to prevent uh, the German bidding zone to be split. So then, then it's sort of nasty and deep politics uh, uh, exactly. uh, very much. I am about to say, it gets very, very political there. I mean... You also touched upon <clears throat> some of the other uh, changes that Acer has called for, some of the proposals, anyway, um, in detail. Um, no, in, you know, for example, you know, it, there are you know, sort of changes on how grid operators sell long-term transmission rights um, to help improve market liquidity. Um, how how does it work now, and how would it then change under these proposals? So today, European TSOs are obliged by law, by European law, um, to submit what's called long-term transmission rights. So they have established an entity that's called JL, and they hold annual auctions and also monthly auctions uh, where market participants and commodity trading houses can buy these LTTRs. F first of all, the term LTTRs I find a bit misleading because because it, it very much sounds what it historically was, physical transmission rights. But really, this is not transmission rights. These are all financial derivatives, very much like forwards and futures. So mm -hmm. if you ask me, we should actually drop the term because we, 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 <laughs> it's confusing to, to everyone um, because we all think of physical lines, but we should rather think of financial derivatives that help people to hedge against the price risk uh, across bidding zones. So to hedge mm -hmm. yourself against the risk that the Belgian price will be higher or lower than the German price or the Austrian price will be higher or lower than the German price. That's the purpose of these of these certificates, of these uh, contracts. So, so, for it's companies, a, so for companies who are active in both markets and want to, you know, insure themselves against any, the price is moving in, in, the, in the opposite direction to which they want them to move in, if you like. That's one possibility. Another possibility is imagine you are a, a check-based generator and you've sold German futures uh, to hedge mm. yourself, then you are exposed still to the price risk that the Czech prices might diverge from mm. the German prices. And that remaining basis risk is something you would like to hedge using these cross-border products. Mm. So the setup of today is that TSOs have to do this and they auction this off on that platform called JL. And they do this by selling options. So they're selling what's in the academic literature is called financial transmission right options, FTR options, Mm -hmm. um, so these are options on the spread between two electricity prices. So it's an option on the German French or the German Czech electricity mm -hmm. price spread on the hourly day ahead spread. That's what they sell today. And indeed, and maybe let's talk about this briefly, in our view, the biggest proposal that ASA has made in their policy paper two years ago is not even the virtual hub that has gained so much sort mm -hmm. of attention. But it's a much more what seems to be a technical change, and that change is to change the type of derivative that's sold by TSOs from an FTR option to a so-called FTR obligation. Mm -hmm. So explain that. What, what, is, what does that? How does how does that change the whole system and and the practice of of, of hedging that cross cross-border electricity? So an FTR obligation. That's another term that. I don't find very useful because <laughs> a financial transmission right obligation is a bit of a contradictory, right? Either mm. either something is a right or it's an obligation, but having a right mm. that's also an obligation is a bit confusing. Mm. I think the best to think about these um, contracts as being financial derivatives that have mm. an underlying that's the spread between two bidding zones, like ja the German-French spot spread and an FDR obligation, the one that ASA would like to see coming is nothing, nothing else than a future on that spread. So we call mm. it a spread future because that's what it is. It's a future mm. contract on that spread. Mm. 
Mm. By the way, these contracts are traded today under different names. Um, effectively, what you can trade on EX, what they call a spread product, is is very much the same contract, just that spread products are not mm. issued by TSOs. They are traded among market parties, and ASA would like to um, um, make TSOs sell the same spread futures. Mm. And what you um, what's what's helpful to know about this that it's a spread future is nothing else. It's exactly the same thing as a combination of two domestic futures. So mm. if you sell a French German spread future, that's absolutely the same thing uh, as selling a German mm. future and buying a French future at the same time. Mm. So it's just a combination of two futures. It's a linked future, and you can you can see that if you trade on EX. Um, you can sort of in, in the in the graphical user interface in the front end, you can buy or sell a spread future, but in the back end in the system that's implemented as the simultaneous trade of two domestic futures of, of selling Germany and buying France at the same time. What does ASA or how would how would you suggest that these kind of contracts get sold in the future? I mean, is there a certain uh, you mentioned the Joint Allocation Office, the JAO. Um, you mentioned uh, exchanges. Would that continue that way? Or, or there's also talk, as far as I understand, of of, of TSOs auctioning these, these contracts as well. So there's a greater role for the grid operators here, is there not? Well, JAO is owned by the TSO. So JAO is mm. essentially a service entity, um, the Joint Allocation Office for the TSO. So the setup today is that Jao kind of runs the auction on behalf of TSOs. And I would assume, and I actually support the idea that that would continue, that we have separate auctions um, for these long-term transmission rights. The alternative would be for TSOs um, to actually engage in continuous forward markets themselves, but regulated entities sort of doing, actually trading on the market is a bit of a dangerous thing as we've seen in the mm -hmm. In the energy crisis, it's it's easy for proper traders to kind of make private benefit out of that situation, and, and they they might be not sort of being the best the best position to do this. Mm -hmm. So having separate auctions makes sense. If they must be conducted by Jao, that's not entirely clear. It could also be someone else. So the the Swedish transmission system op operator Svenska Kraftnet has run similar um, auctions, and they have commissioned a broker to do that on their behalf. Um, that's a possibility. Another way to look at this is uh, European governments um, sell off their emission certificates, right? Their EUAs, and mm. they ask someone to do that on their behalf. So it's not the German government that runs the auction. It's in that case, it's EX, uh, the energy mm. exchange that does it on that behalf. They could also be a possible candidate um, mm. uh, for for running these LTTR auctions. So in my view, that's a service that should be tendered, and whoever does the auction near as, as, as the best service at the lowest price, uh, in my view, should, should do that job. Because if the TSOs were to do it directly themselves, that would obviously change their roles quite substantially in the market. And it's, um, it, this is very complex. As you said, they're not, they're, they're not commodity trading houses, so maybe they, they shouldn't be uh, in that role as well as guaranteeing security of supply. In a way, yes and no. So mm. I, I I look at them the same way. They shouldn't interfere with markets. They shouldn't change prices. They shouldn't trade. They shouldn't take positions. But if you emit LTTRs, and they've been doing this for at least a decade or so, you effectively do all that. You do mm. engage in the market. You do take a position. You do affect prices. So every... Mm. FTR option that today German or European or any other TSO sells uh, through these auctions are bought up by someone. And that might be a commodity trading house. Hmm. It's not so much the, the small utilities, it's probably more a professionalized trading houses. And they buy these options and what they usually do is they can either keep them on their books for speculation. They believe it's a good price. They like to keep the risk and they um, they keep that on the books and hope to make a profit out of this. Or at some point, they start delta hedging that option. So they take a position, let's say they've bought a German-Belgium FDR option. So they start taking positions on the German and the Belgium forward market. So maybe they sell German forwards and they buy Belgium forwards. Mm. And by doing so, of course, 
they will impact forward prices, right? Mm-hmm. If they do this in large volumes, they do shift. They 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 do shift the forward premium. They introduce a, a, a shift in the prices, and effectively, if you take the whole chain and you look at this from the end to the be- to the from the beginning to the end, of course, TSOs by selling these options did have an impact on prices and did shift the Belgium and the French and the and the German forward price. So the the view that TSOs shouldn't have do anything that will impact prices is just mm. incompatible with the very notion that they should sell LTTRs. It's not mm. just capacity what they sell. You can't sell just capacity forward. You always have an impact on on forward prices and forward markets. Absolutely. No, fascinating, Leon. I mean, just just finally to say, okay, at, at the moment they're just proposals. They're, you know, what would what needs to happen for some of this to actually uh, come into force? And how long do you expect that to take? So there is a bit of that reform in the legislative process for the electricity market reform that I, I'm not sure, but should be sort of done soon. There has been a compromise uh, two months ago, or just before Christmas, actually. Um, but that's relatively soft language. So the, the, the virtual hub is mentioned, but there also needs to be an impact assessment first. Um, so the, the legislative track uh, with the electricity market directive and uh, regulation is is one end and then there's possibly a reform of the forward um, capacity allocation guideline of the FCA one of the network codes that we have that um, kind of establishes or prescribes how when and how much LTTRs TSO, TSOs must issue and that's probably where that reform would be implemented mm-hmm. I'm not a legal expert I'm not a policy making expert but mm-hmm. that's my guess um and that could happen um, or be, be formally started uh, by, by the end of the week, uh, the end of the year, maybe, and 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 come into force next year. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's really a wide guess. I'm not I'm not very much involved in these processes. I'm my concern is mostly that um, we very much understand what kind of reform we are taking, and my reading from the discussion, following the debate, and following the statements, and following the arguments and workshops and stakeholder consultations is that even fundamental questions are still not well understood by everyone and there's a lot of sort of a lot of loose ends that we should close before changing the law and changing the way the market is set up Mm. so a lot of work that still needs to be done here leon many thanks for joining the montel weekly podcast leon Thanks for having me.